The knee is a superficial joint. Interposed between the femur and the tibia, it is prone to injury. Because of the shape of the articulating surfaces, there is little inherent stability in the knee joint, and the ligamentous structures play an extremely important role in maintaining stability of the knee. Inspection. Both legs must be adequately exposed and comparison between the knees should be made throughout the examination. During the gait cycle, the knee is maintained in slight flexion except at the point of heel strike when it is in full extension. With the patient standing and weight borne equally through both lower extremities, observe the angle between the femoral and the tibial axis. Normally, the tibia is in slight valgus with respect to the femur and is usually more pronounced in the female because of the wider pelvis than in the male. Excessive valgus or genu valgum gives rise to the knock knee deformity in which the medial aspect of the knees are in contact with each other while the medial malleoli are widely separated at the ankles. In varus deformities of the knees, or genu varum, the knees are separated, but the medial malleoli are in contact with each other. Genu varum is commonly associated with medial compartment osteoarthritis of the knee. Although the varus and valgus deformities illustrated are bilateral, they may be unilateral. Atrophy. While still observing the patient from in front, note the muscular contour above the thigh and knee. Specifically, note any atrophy of the vastus medialis, which may be associated with traumatic or degenerative knee pathology. Swelling. Note any enlargement of the knee as compared to the other knee. This may be due to localized swelling or generalized swelling about the knee, and the precise cause will be appreciated by the examiner when palpating the knee. Patella. Note that the patellae should be at the same level, and each pointing in a similar direction. Next, Observe the patient from the side. The knee should be in full extension. In females and adolescents, occasionally slight hyperextension up to 5 degrees, also known as back knee or recruvatum, is normal, providing that it is symmetrical. While standing behind the patient, observe the popliteal fossa region, noting in particular any swelling as compared to the other side. Palpation. Bony landmarks. Patella. With the patient in the supine position, palpate the patella. Its size and shape should be noted and compared to the opposite knee. The superior and inferior pole of the patella can be localized. By pressing the patella medially, with the thumb, the undermedial surface can be palpated, noting any tenderness or irregularity, and likewise with lateral pressure applied to its medial border, the lateral articular aspect can be palpated. With the patella displaced either medially or laterally, also palpate the anterior portion of the femoral condyle, which becomes uncovered. Tibial tubercle. With the knees now flexed to 90 degrees, locate the inferior pole of the patella. Palpating inferiorly along the course of the patellar tendon, the examiner encounters the tibial tubercle, which may be excessively tender and prominent in the adolescent with osgood schlatter syndrome. Palpating upwards with the thumb along each side of the patellar tendon, the examiner notes a depression anteriorly. 
With firm pressure inwards and upwards, the examiner locates the medial and lateral femoral condyles respectively, and with pressure directed more inferiorly, the anterior margins of the medial and lateral tibial plateaus can be palpated. Medial tibial plateau. Localize the anterior border of the medial tibial plateau and follow its prominence around the posterior medial corner of the knee to the point where its definition is lost in the soft tissues. Medial femoral condyle. Return to the anteromedial depression and palpate upwards, localizing the medial femoral condyle. Palpate the surface of the condyle superiorly towards the upper pole of the patella, noting any areas of tenderness or actual defects which might be palpable. Medially, palpate the edge of the condyle from its position above the medial tibial plateau, superiorly towards the upper pole of the patella. Carefully palpate the medial aspect of the medial femoral condyle and locate the prominent adductor tubercle posteriorly. Lateral tibial plateau. Locate the anterior depression just lateral to the patellar tendon, and inferiorly, the examiner locates the anterior aspect of the lateral tibial plateau. Follow the upper aspect of the lateral tibia posteriorly and the prominence of Gurdy's tubercle. The site of insertion of the fascia lata is palpable. Head of the fibula. Continue to follow the lateral tibial plateau around posteriorly until a more lateral prominence is encountered. This is the head of the fibula, and its anterior and posterior border should be localized. Lateral femoral condyle. Return to the anterolateral soft tissue depression and palpating upwards, locate the lateral femoral condyle. Less of the articular surface of the lateral femoral condyle is palpable than the medial condyle because of the overlying lateral aspect of the patella. Palpation. Soft tissues. Because the knee joint is superficial, Inflammatory or infectious conditions causing elevated temperature in the knee can be readily detected by the examiner. Slide the palm of the hand down the anterior thigh, over the knee and along the anterior aspect of the tibia. A change in temperature gradient, if present, will be readily noted by the examiner. Anterior aspect. With the patient supine, instruct the patient to isometrically contract the quadriceps muscle. Regions of the vastus medialis and vastus lateralis are noted, and palpate each region and compare to the opposite extremity, noting the consistency and firmness of the muscle mass. If there is weakness of the vastus medialis, the muscle will not feel as firm as compared to its opposite normal. Carefully palpate the tenderness insertion of the rectus femoris and vastus intermedius into the superior pole region of the patella, noting any tenderness or palpable defect. Patellar tendon. Locate the inferior pole of the patella and palpate the patellar tendon distally to the tibial tubercle. This tendon can be made more prominent by flexing the knee to 90 degrees and palpating the tendon between the thumb and index finger. Any tenderness, swelling, or defect should be noted. Swelling. Diffuse soft tissue swelling of the knee, secondary to contusion, can occur. Fluid about the knee may also be localized in one of the several bursae of the knee, or it may be intraarticular and manifested by a generalized enlargement of the knee, most notable in the suprapatellar pouch. Intraarticular fluid may collect posteriorly in the popliteal region and is termed a Baker cyst. Localized swelling. Bursae. 
prepatellar, superficial, infrapatellar, pace, and serine. Prepatellar bursa. The prepatellar bursa is located anterior to the patella. Normally, the anterior bony surface of the patella is palpable directly underlying the skin. Any thickening or fluctuance anterior to the patella is suggestive of an inflammatory condition of the prepatellar bursa. Superficial infrapatellar bursa. Swelling in the region of the superficial infrapatellar bursa, which overlies the patellar tendon, can occur as a result of repetitive trauma, such as in kneeling activities. Pace anserine bursa. The pace anserine bursa is located deep to the insertion of the sartorius, gracilis, and semitendinosus muscles on the medial aspect of the upper tibia and this region should be palpated, noting any swelling, thickening, or tenderness. Generalized swelling. Effusion hemarthrosis. Synovial thickening. Bony enlargement. Soft tissue swelling. Effusion hemarthrosis. Fluid within the knee joint is known as an effusion if it arises from synovial inflammation, and if it is secondary to bleeding within the knee joint, it is called a hemarthrosis. To test for fluid within the knee joint, the patient must be supine and the quadriceps muscle relaxed. Place one hand anteriorly over the knee so that the thumb and index finger straddle the patella. With the other hand just above the patella in the region of the suprapatellar pouch, press downwards. If fluid is present in the suprapatellar pouch, it will be squeezed inferiorly, and the fluid pulse imparted to the thumb and index finger will be appreciated by the examiner. By keeping the suprapatellar pouch obliterated, pressure applied by the fingers on the medial aspect will cause a fluid wave to be discerned by the examiner's thumb. Conversely, if pressure is applied to both the medial and the lateral aspects of the knee while relaxing the pressure on the suprapatellar pouch region, the fluid wave can be appreciated by the examiner's hand as fluid is pushed back into the region of the suprapatellar pouch. Patellar tap or patellar belotment. To perform the patellar tap or belotment test, apply pressure to obliterate the suprapatellar pouch while the thumb and fingers palpate laterally and medially, respectively. With the other hand, press the patella sharply downwards onto the femur and release. The patellar tap or patellar belotment sign is not an absolute indication of an effusion. It is dependent on the patella being floated off the articular surface of the femur, which will not occur if the effusion is too small. In a moderate effusion, the patella will sink until it contacts the femur, then spring back up. The thumb and fingers of the hand obliterating the suprapatellar pouch will also detect a fluid wave. In a large tense effusion, the examiner will not be able to depress the patella against the femur without causing undue pain to the patient. Knee swelling may also be caused by synovial thickening. In this case, the examiner notes a boggy thickening, especially to palpation of the suprapatellar pouch region. Enlargement of bone or osteophytes, especially in the region of the femoral condyles, may also cause apparent swelling of the knee. Medial joint line and medial meniscus. With the patient sitting and the foot supported on 